Peak for all of Kanyama students that there's a certain level of detail that we try to achieve, and she won't let us go until we get that. As soon as he picked up the bow and played Sa, it's like, wow, whoa. This is I got I understand. This is this is the stamp. This is the mark of a legend. I had to burp in the middle of my penny out to them, and then I tried to hold it in, and then I started coughing. I used to apparently empty out my parents' kitchen, put all the pots and pans on the floor, and start banging on them. Someone almost kidnapped me in a temple once. Hi, Kamlukin. Hi, Vignesh. We are so glad to have you today. Um, thank you so much for your time. So we'll start with the very beginning. So I know Kamlukin and you learned from Kanyama currently, and Vignesh, you learned from Sivaraman sir currently. But let's go before that, when you started. Um, so I'll start. Um, well, hello, Tambavi and uh, Sriram and Vignesh. Um, <laughs> Good to see you all. Um, so with me, I think music was not really a choice. I was born, um, it's a choice now, but when I started off, it was not so, and I'm glad that it wasn't because now, you know, I'm able to do it with so much passion and love. But um, when I started, I started with my grandfather, um, uh, Parthasar the Iyengar, and then I learned from my dad, uh, Subhash Um And when I was learning from my dad, we realized after a certain age that it's hard to blur the boundaries between teacher and student and father and son. And he decided that my antics were becoming too much for him. So he <laughs> shipped me off to India. And that's when I started learning from uh, Kanyama. And um, since then, since 2006, I've been learning from her. Okay. Um, additionally, I also learn a little bit of Mirdangam and yeah. uh, I sing here and there, but mainly I'm focusing on violin. On my end, also, hi everyone. Good to, good to be here on this kind of gloomy Sunday morning in California. Um, my journey was pretty abbreviated, honestly, because when I was a kid, apparently I used to, whenever someone would play a recording, I'd be able to either bob my head or wiggle back and forth to the, to the proper rhythm. And uh, so my first rhythm teacher, Anand Dyer, when he was visiting my parents' house, this was back in the day of old cassette tapes, so you could adjust the playback speed. Yeah we'd turn down the playback speed and my wiggling would adjust accordingly and he'd speed it up and my wiggling would adjust accordingly. He's like, oh, this guy has a pretty decent sense of rhythm. Let's get him started. The other potentially fake tale is I used to apparently empty out my parents' kitchen, put all the pots and pans on the floor and start banging on them. And so my mom, to try to preserve her sanity, decided that there's a far more productive way to handle this. So she uh, started me with Rudangam lessons. Um, the kind of side note here is my grandfather and Chodam and Sir were very close. Um, they would apparently go watch James Bond movies together when, I, when they were kids or, or when they were younger. Um, so my parents always wanted me to be in that school in that style. And so as a happy coincidence, there was exactly one disciple in like the greater Eastern seaboard named Anandayar who uh, was based in Boston for a little bit then in DC. Yeah. And right around the time he moved to D.C., we moved to California, and then I started learning from him directly when we went to India every summer. So that was on the Murdangam side. Um, my mom also apparently tried to start me in Vietnam, which my brother currently plays, but she uh, banished me after like half a lesson, the same as my father and his best friend, because <laughs> we were any good. Um, so go ahead and eventually ended up winning that lottery and being able to play Vietnam. And then uh, vocal music-wise... Um, I learned from my Murdangam teacher, Anand Mama's sister, Minata. Um, so we learned a lot from her and then now from Sridham Kumar in India. Guys, if we just um, could delve into the experience of learning from such um, prestigious artists such as Kanyama and um, Siram and Sir, would you mind just uh, talking a little bit about that experience? Yeah, um, for me, actually, I have to talk about classes with my father as well, because mm -hmm. um, it'd be incomplete if I don't. But uh, so I'll start with my father. Um, I have had everyone compliment me at some level. Um, be like, oh, you played well. 
to this day, I have not heard my dad say that to me, even wow. after any concert. Um, even even Kanyama has told me that, hey, today you played well. But my father <laughs> no, just did not play well. So side note, so I think a lot of the, um, the classes that I have at home, um, my father really focuses on fingering techniques, um, you know, mastery of the instrument overall, playing on, you know, three strings, going on one string, uh, different exercises like Alan Karam's Dr. Versus, uh, put on a metronome, play to the speed. Um, all of that has happened and it's almost like you know working out after a class with my father because it's like i can't play any longer after that yeah with my guru uh kanyama when i i actually my i remember my first class really well because uh she asked me to play the saveri varnam we did not get past yeah. we did not get past that for two hours wow I remember this very well. She was trying to get me to play that yeah. like bang all those gamma comes right, and I would play I, I would do something wrong every yeah. time. And it was weird because there were other students as well, and they were all like eyeing me. <laughs> I was just sitting there, and as much as then I was so scared, the, like almost every class after that, I really, I think what that's really done is made me and every other I can I think I can speak for all of Kanyama students that there's a certain level of detail that we try to achieve and she won't let us go until we get that and I think that's the biggest thing that I've really gained is that style that detail level of detail um, that I have to achieve and so there have been classes where I've learned four songs in the span of an hour there have also been classes where I've only done one sangati in the span of three, four hours. And so wow. um, either way, it's just, and then of course, mano dharmam challenges, you know, that's always there. And, um, you know, every class is priceless in its own way. Um, but I think really my fondest memories are, as much as it sounds painful right now, really repeating the same sangati again and again, because it, it really made me focus on those details. So, yeah. Amazing. Nice. I think similar sentiments from my side. Shodam and Sir is, I think in a word, the, the old masters tend to be very uncompromising with what they expect from you. <laughs> and the level of detail, the, basically their level of attentiveness to detail is beyond things, anything that we do by default. And it's something that you really have to force yourself into that mindset of, you know, that was close. That's like a, you know, a B minus, but, you know, I have to get it to a B plus and then an A minus yeah. and then an A plus. Um, and 100 is just unachievable because that's ultimate perfection and you're never quite there. Um, Shodam in particular is, so he has, the way he teaches is he has his shishib relays, his students conduct most classes and he'll come in and supervise. And when you're having your arangetram or any other kind of big concert, um, for example, like when I play for Spirit of Youth, he'll come and audit and make sure that things are, are up to snuff. Um, his shishib relays are equally as uncompromising when it comes to detail. They're mindful of the fact that no one's ever going to achieve kind of that that mountaintop level of perfection, but they keep forcing you to like complete the Sisyphean task of rolling the boulder up the mountain, at least give it your best shot. Mm. Um, I think the the biggest thing is, I mean, one anecdote I can relay is after my Arangetram, I was playing a Mora Korve that Shuram Sir normally plays, which is Kurkala Mel Kalam Tasragadi. And at one point, at, like for a maybe like a quarter matra, I slipped in the in playing the final ending, I, I had a small mistake there. I don't think anyone noticed. I had, no, I believed, I would have sworn to you after the concert that not a soul would have noticed. It would have just sounded like, you know, some random scratch of the middle or something. Yeah. I walked down the staircase at Shastri Alantra Raman sir says, uh, I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, just, I think, indicative of the level of attentiveness. This is an Arangetram where, you know, the mic system exploded in the middle of the concert and he had to wow. speak before and after. And over a three hour concert, he was able to pick out like one of the many mistakes, but one of like the most minute mistakes that I'd made in the entire concert. Mm -hmm. I think the level of detail that all of us should aspire to when we're doing music, because you are really trying to practice for yeah. perfection. And, yeah. uh, I should rephrase what I said about my uh, father never saying that I haven't played well. It's not that he hasn't said that he never said good job, but it's more what Vignesh just described. He'll say like, okay, it was good, but, and he'll always like it's point really out cool, right? minute detail that yeah. I wouldn't have noticed and I think that, that sometimes even I won't notice and I'll fight with him for an hour and then he'll <laughs> play the recording and then obviously I'm yeah. like yeah, okay yeah <laughs> but I guess I guess you sort of need someone like that just you know to keep you 
keep you pushing for that level of perfection. Okay. But I guess now it's not, so this was all like face to face, but now it's more online platforms, right? The way you learn from um, such lessons in India. So how does that work? What's your kind of experience through online learning? It's really interesting on my end because the Shiravansar is fairly hands off past a certain point in that he believes that it, it's music is self-expression, right? So to a point, he's like, don't be a clone of anyone. Like understand that like he, he's not opposed to like going out and understanding different schools. Mm -hmm. He obviously has his preference for how he plays, um, and but he doesn't like dictate to a very fine degree. Like this is exactly what you should play at this particular spot. Yeah pretty open-minded in terms of you figuring out what you need to play where. Mm. Um, it means that generally the interactions with the Shishipalais and even himself, so him I'll call on the phone um, and the Shishipalais I'll interact with through WhatsApp and stuff. And they'll ping around recordings and compositions that they've made and things that he has played or, or, or recrafted for this particular year. Um, that does, of course, that's in a little bit in tension with this notion of super perfection because in a non-face-to-face -face medium, there's a lot of things that can get lost in translation. Yeah. It's less of an issue when you become a more quote-unquote senior student, when you have a better understanding of what things should sound like or should feel like or should be played like. Mm. But especially for younger students, as I see the kind of modern trend towards embracing this technology, there is one caveat, which is like, do you really know that the student is sitting up perfectly straight when they're playing the button? Mm. Do you know their posture is good? Do you know that, you know, their topi is looking exactly the same way it should be when you're focused on the right side or vice versa? Yeah. Um, so it, it, I think even for someone like me, I've learned something online and then come back and played it in front, in front of the Shishi for person. They're like, dude, that's completely wrong. You, you missed the key crux of this whole thing. And I'm like, oh, wow, that was lost in translation. Yeah. So I think that the, there, there's major benefits to technology. Um, one thing I was going to say for the previous thing is, you know, audio never lies. When you have a recording of a concert and there's a debate about whether something's right or wrong, <laughs> yeah. And you know for a fact it's no longer subject to the intricacies of your memory and human mind. Yeah. But on the same token, there are some drawbacks of this technology. Um, for example, like this, if, when we end up playing for this podcast, um, we're not going to be able to play together because you're not yet in sync. Like you can't do accompaniment over over yeah. Zoom calls or Skype or WhatsApp. Um, on my end, I think. So I've never had a Skype, Zoom, Hangout, FaceTime, um, but so it's usually phone classes. So yeah. I uh, dial her uh, phone, keep mm. it on speakerphone. She will sing. I'll repeat, or she'll ask me to play some ragam. Yeah. Now I've granted these are not as often as I would like, yeah. um, and I would actually put the blame on that for myself because you know, as you know, juggling so many things but then also at the same time I mean for her and I like finding a common time is yeah. is part of a challenge yeah. but more than that I think after a certain level like um Vignesh said it's very kind of hands-off guidance yeah. um but still that doesn't mean to say that she's not keeping tabs yeah, like yeah, yeah. I think the biggest thing for me is I would have played a concert a chamber concert right. in I don't know like Oklahoma or something and I'll call her the next day and she'll be like, hi, I heard you played here. And I, I have no idea who told her that I had a concert. I have no idea how she knows what I played and yeah. where I'm at. Like, I, I, I'm still astounded to how that happens. Yeah. It's happened many times. So. Yeah. But back to the learning, I think more than just like learning songs or learning, you know, Mano yeah. a lot of the learning just happens in just being in conversation and having their presence around yeah. so a lot of the times we'll have like two hour conversations on the mm -hmm. phone and I might sing a little bit or she, she'll be like hey I have an idea listen to this idea and a lot of times I think that is the most priceless form of learning because that one idea leads to a hundred ideas yeah, that yeah. that's basically what's supposed to happen yeah and so a lot of the times uh that ends up happening which for me is also considered if if someone asks when did i have a, my last class i'd probably say four days ago when i spoke to her last even yeah. if that might not be physically me playing the violin and, yeah yeah so yeah that's my experience with so I know Kenya Ma, she sings, right? And you would have to right. play. So was that how your father taught you initially? And how did you find that transition from? Actually, no, that's not how my, how my oh, father. Okay. It was it's okay. Also, it's weird because it's hard to teach that in the very beginning, I would imagine, because you need to learn how to actually hold the violin. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So it was, 
it was definitely quite a shock because I remember when I was when I went to learn from her I was nine mm. um, not yet nine I was actually eight years old okay. so I didn't know the actual value of what I was getting at that time and I didn't I mean it wasn't as easy to like find recordings or maybe it was but I didn't bother yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the first I think five six months I was like I haven't heard her play yet because <laughs> it's like it's all been you know through yeah. vocal yeah. it was I think that's why the Sarasuda line took two hours. <laughs> so it definitely was, it definitely was a transition, but the most priceless transition because yeah. now when you accompany all sorts of styles, mm. you already do it from classes. So I, I really yeah. value that. And yeah, definitely. Um, I just had a question. So Vignesh, you touched upon this about how Siran said not to clone anyone. How have you found your own sort of style and how do you, um, display that? I think it just takes time and refinement. It's a lot of listening to a lot of different people, um, your gurus, of course, and their contemporaries and, and the gold masters, and trying to see what really is really about what floats your boat, right? And there's obviously other inputs, like I have my brother, my family, my wife, everyone offers input into how things should sound. And then it's kind of about, you know, tying those threads together into some coherent package that makes sense. Um, there's still significant debate amongst my family and Kamala Kitten has input into this as well. Everyone who I play for has input into this about what things should sound like and what's like the most apt thing to play. Yeah. The, the magic of our music, I guess, is that there's never one real right answer. There's like the technically correct and then there's a whole bunch of subjective stuff. Yeah. Um, so balancing all the subjective when there's many different inputs, like I want to play something one way, Arthi will say play it a different way, Gohan will say play it a different way. My parents will say, mm, you know, something's not quite, you know, I, I wasn't quite okay with that. <laughs> yeah. say, you know, that was really good. I'm like, okay, wait, what the heck? I've got five <laughs> different viewpoints. Yeah. Um, and not to mention your teacher, of course, because the Shodam and Sir, the Shishapur, everyone will offer input and say, you know, this would sound better, this would sound worse. Um, you kind of just have to balance all of those inputs and tie it together in something that you're at the end of the day happy with. And the, I guess the kind of sad truth is that you're never going to be hundred percent happy. Mm -hmm. And that I guess kind of what makes it fun is there's always something else to try something else to do something new. Speaking about Barney or like style of playing, I know you're coming again, you've got quite a few students and I'm probably big as yourself, but it's amazing that not only are your students so good, but they've also somehow got your style, like your unique style of playing. And you can hear it, you can hear it through their playing. How's your teaching got, got that to them? So I actually feel really weird referring to myself as a teacher. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't hit yet because I think a lot of, especially when I'm talking about, we're talking about like teachers, like yeah. and my own guru. Okay, yeah. Like, I don't think I should be really talking about this, but yeah. Um, I will say in my own style, um, my own style, which I've not, I don't know, just like what Vignesh has said, it's impossible it to ever be happy with it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is my father's influence along with, so that's why I think like my influences from both Kanyama and my father really shape um, my playing in a certain way. I'm not sure. I can't quantify that in any way. I would just... Yeah hope that I have a good mixture and I strive to having that mixture. Yeah. Um, so when I teach, um, I really, as I said, I valued the lessons that I've gotten from my guru when yeah. she sang and when she taught. And so whenever I teach, I do my best to try to teach in the way I was taught. Yeah. Um, so I don't typically, unless we're doing I, I won't say I'm not able to do it the way my guru does it it's just impossible I don't know how she has that magic touch yeah. where she can just sing and you play yeah so and I'll, she also has the patience I'll sing four times and then I'll be like all right this is how it's <laughs> playing so <laughs> yeah. but but I do my best to make sure that I also only sing there's certain Kanyama there's certain things she always emphasizes on that's one playing with Sahityam definitely make sure the Sahityam bowing is there She'll always say style, style, style. Yeah. It, it's hard to understand what that means yeah. because there's not much more than the word style. But yeah. once you understand what that means, yeah. you automatically do, like it, it becomes part of you. Yeah. And I think I've been trying to articulate that word as best as I can so that whoever I teach can also mm -hmm. um, pick up. And I, I hope. Uh, and 
the biggest thing in teaching is for me, it's the biggest learning experience. I think I've learned just as much when I've been teaching, just from trying to convey it. Because unless you really know what you're trying to convey, you can't convey yeah. it. So it's yeah. really testing of what you're able to do yeah. and a really huge rewarding experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a really yeah. cheap cop out answer, which is that I only have one very <laughs> informal student um, who actually would be, I think, miffed if I said, oh yeah, I just quoted you as a student on, on a podcast. Uh, Shodaman sir has been cajoling me to try to teach more and that's something that I definitely do have to make time for but Mm -hmm. as of right now it's not something that I've been able to incorporate into the other mix of stuff Mm -hmm. one of the answers that I gave him to he asked me this this season or last season when he asked why I haven't started teaching he's like oh I'm not super happy with with how I'm playing yet I want to make sure that I'm happy with that before I start teaching to which he quoted his famous line, if you want to be happy with how you play before you ascend the stage you'll be 80 years old and the same thing (laughs) So it's something that, um, I mean, once the, the current coronavirus crisis fades and we're able to resume some sort of normalcy, um, I think that is something that I'm looking to to dive into a little bit. Yeah. So um, both of you um, I've seen have played with BBS Mama at the Cleveland Aradana, I, I believe, I think last year, maybe mm-hmm. a few years back. That was okay. an, an incredible experience because obviously he is a legend and I just want to know your experience. Like, what was it like on stage, off stage, maybe during the rehearsals or practices, if you had any, just your the entire experience, really? I think the same word that I used earlier, the uncompromisingness, is the yeah. it, it's it fits like a glove. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you you can imagine. I think one of the songs that we played, and at least the first time we did it, was Ghana Mufe. Um, the number of times he had us repeat, and I'm only hearing about the second hand because I arrived super late um, and I caught a red eye and like flew in on the morning of the concert. But yeah. apparently in practice, like the first Sangadi of Ghana Mufte was repeated probably five, 10, 15 times. Um, he, it's, I think just the effect of sitting there, mm. let, let me put it this way. Like uh, when he picked up the violin and just bowed saw, mm. there's something different about it. And this is not just like a, this isn't like, oh, it, in deference to the, to the legend. It's like, there's a tangibly like different feeling when yeah. he picks up and plays something. The, and the feel with which he plays and how he is able to, just with like a basic sangari, convey so much depth. Um, to come look at his point about that style comment, as soon as he picked up the bow and played Sa, it's like, wow, whoa, this is I got it. I understand, this is, this is the stamp, this is the mark of a legend. And just being around that, and he was pretty, I mean, we, like, I think myself and Atri went to get him some soda, um, <laughs> would ask his wife if, he, if she wanted any soda. It was just a very interesting experience to be around someone. Um, he also, he also knew my grandfather, um, in a coincidental notes, when I reminded him of that, he put pieces together and he's like, oh, goodness. And then he, we had a good laugh about old times. Yeah. For me, this is, I think for me, like, you know, there's this like joke about you have a test, you sleep on the textbook, the next day morning you'll wake up and you'll like ace the test. I honestly believe with every one of these legends, there's some sort of osmosis happening. Like you don't need to, just like being in their presence and like interacting with them, you'll you'll get something. Yeah. And I think like what he said, the second you hold Sa, like there are a thousand things you can say right now, like the way he holds the bow, how he how much pressure he puts on the bow, how each bow, like each bow is like so seamless and you don't hear the actual changes and it's so smooth and yeah, he just played saw. And there's already so much you can really notice from that saw that makes, yeah. and this is for, true for every legend. There's something that, or multiple things that, that just make, that you can take just being in their presence. And um, as long as you're just diligent about noticing those things um, and then, again all of these people are like my role models just like in in so many ways i just grow up hoping that you can achieve some amount of perfection that they have yeah and so just being there was like and he's right we repeated i remember he actually he came and he closed his eyes for maybe five minutes and it was just complete silence he didn't say anything we were all scared we're like okay i don't know if we did something wrong like what's gonna happen (laughs) he just opened and started singing and it was just, it was the most divine, like, yeah. I, can't, I can't use any other word to ex- uh, express that. It was just a very divine experience. Yeah. The other interesting thing is, 
especially when you listen to someone like VVS, the, the fun thing to do is to find a recording of them and just isolate the violin half of the track if it's a stereo recording. Yeah. And just listen to the accompaniment level of detail. This was harder to do when we were on stage because we were kind of nervous and not really paying attention to the yeah. overall cohesive surroundings. But yeah. for example, when Atre was playing, I just sit down and listen to how he was playing amidst the group of us. And yeah. he was like, he was both leading us and accompanying us like for effect. Yeah. And the balance between the two was, I mean, it, it's, it's worth taking another listen um, always to when a great master is accompanying to see what kinds of things they do and what kinds of nuances they're able to convey just by being there and like understanding the music and, and doing something that they think is pleasing musically. Yeah. But honestly, such an amazing opportunity, I think, um, with such legends to even be on stage. I can't even imagine. Yeah. So you sit next to him. I think it is. Honestly, you guys are very fortunate. But of course, you very lucky. Obviously, because you are, play so well that you know you've been given this opportunity. So I, I've I've followed you guys on YouTube for quite a while now, and um, I always see you with some sort of uh, legendary top top artist. Um, could you just tell us a bit more about that? And the you know when you first started playing for these top artists, how nervous were you? Um, how did you overcome that sort of thing? Uh, how, how long did it take you to you know, get into your strides almost? I think, honestly, from my perspective, I've never been super nervous for any concert because I think there's a lot of trust in the preparation that goes in behind it. Um, like you have, you have your fallback mechanisms, right? And I think for Murlingam especially, you never know what's going to show up. Like you, no one's going to, very few people are going to send you an entire itemized concert list with exactly the amount of Swadam or Netable and the kind of cause they're going to do. So there's right. a certain level of, you know, fly by the city of your pants that you're used to and indoctrinated in. Mm -hmm. So playing it by ear is what you do for any concert. So it's really no different. Just the person who you're chasing is a lot more senior and has a lot more, you know, ammunition to throw at you. So I don't think there's ever been an issue of nervousness. I think finding the stride is a question of playing for them more than once or for a longer period of time. Okay. If you told me I had to accompany some great legend for one song, I'd actually be more nervous than for a full concert. Because in that one song, I'd have to demonstrate that I'm capable of playing things, get used to how they sing, how they put thought on, how they play. Um, do they put thought on at all? Um, <laughs> so many other different variables. Um, whereas for a longer concert, like you take maybe one or two songs, um, and then you get used to what they're doing, you, you pick up what they're putting down, and then you move forward from there. I will say, I think that the biggest thing that I've learned over the years is, you know, everyone has their own preferences for how they want you to play. And mm. trying to reverse engineer that is sometimes worth an honest conversation beforehand. Like, sir, what would you, or, or madam, what would you like me to do? Like, how, how, what do you prefer? And some people will be very transparent and open about this. Like, I, I prefer this style, I prefer this thing. Others aren't, and that may come back to bite you later. So I think kind of trying to divine that answer is really helpful when you're a company. Yeah. So it also has to do with um, not only trying to highlight their style, but also trying to find a a way to showcase your own style within that without compromising their music. It's always, um, especially as a violinist, that's very important. You're not only um, supposed to be able to play the style or be part of that style, part of that music, but also somehow also highlight some level of individuality without compromising um, what's going on. And I think for any concert, and especially when it comes to uh, more senior and um, artists, it's, it's um, important to keep that in mind. And I think a lot of, an another big part of it for me is um, I've grown up listening to some of these people being like, you know, we learned from these people. We've learned from, you know, whether it's Balamuli or, or Shankar and Mama or someone like that. It's like, you know, I hear them. And first of all, when you go into a concert like that, you're like, okay, how am I first of all on this stage? <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, that awe of being there and that awe to be able to learn whatever during that, that process, it's always learning experience. Mm. obviously it's also to be like all right you know the hard work that I've put in or that we have put in continue to put in there's some it, hopefully it can show in the concert yeah. but um, yeah it's it's definitely kind of a kid in the candy store just like so excited it's definitely more excitement than nervousness I don't think just like Viggy said um, I've never really been um, nervous for a concert I can't say I've ever been nervous um, 
I've always had an adrenaline rush, but that's more excitement than nervousness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking about preparing for concerts, do you think a song list can make or break a concert? It can definitely make or break a concert. Yeah. Um, because, um, and Big Nation knows I'm notorious of having great concerts or not so great concerts. A lot of it is because of, uh, when I'm talking about in my solos, it's, it's definitely a song list thing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as much as it would be great to be able to play or sing without caring about certain rules, which I think, not rules, they're unsaid rules. They're not rules, yeah, yeah. Like, you can do it. And I think great masters can definitely pull off anything and, you know, give a concert, you know. For example, like Shemunguri, you know the song list before you listen to the concert. Yet you can listen to every concert with the same amount of, you know, involvement, same yeah. amount of enthusiasm. And it's going to be different every time. Even if it's technically the same song, you're, you can learn from it every time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we have not reached that level. So <laughs> I think for people like us, especially, it's, it's definitely a huge deal to keep that song list yeah. in mind. I mean, what are the kind of things that you think about before you, you know, say you've got a concert coming up, what kind of things do you think about when you're preparing for a song list? I can say that the thing that I'm most looking forward to as a Berlangist is variety, yeah. the spice of life, right? So yeah. I think concerts that I prefer, and this is a very subjective thing, but the concerts that I prefer kind of adhere to at least a couple of different roles, like, oh, you need a, some large piece expanded in so the Enpratima Dimums. Um, you need Tharam variety, you need to slot in the Sarchapa Kanda Chapa elsewhere. Pace variety is a big one. Like yeah. you could have a list that has checks all the boxes, but if you take everything at a uniform Kala Pramanam in the song, it doesn't have the same variety. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing I push Gohan and Kamla Kid and people who I have input basically on what I can force them to play <laughs> is to is to is add variety. Make sure that at least sequential songs, if not like a set of three songs have enough variety between them to, to make things interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm so, less of a stickler on that, as Vignesh knows. Yes. Um, but the problem with that is also I do go into my concerts with the knowledge that it might not be as, as good as it could be if I had this variety. Yeah. But another thing that my father always says is that, not that I would ever do the whole concert, but if you're going to play Riti Gaula and then play Ananda Bhairavi right after Riti Gaula, I'm, I won't do this in a concert, but you should be technically, you should know both yeah. ragas so well yeah. that you should be able to play both of them simultaneously. Oh, yeah. You should be able to create that variety and you yeah. should be able to showcase that. That's how well you should know those ragas. That's yeah. what he says all the time. Now, this isn't to say that I would do this in a concert, yeah. but well, that's that definitely way. what you're striving for. Yeah, um, yeah. The same thing kind of applies to the whole, like the traditional concert planning list setting mechanism as laid down by Adi in the I guess the early 20th century. Mm. That's a, a means to an end, right? It's a it's it's a mechanism for kind of downscoping what were like sprawling four hour things that were a little bit inaccessible and making them more like bite sized and consumable. There's many different ways to skin the cat, though. So there's nothing like intrinsically. If you can basically inject the excitement that you need to, and you don't have to follow that set list, or you can do a Riti Gaula after an Ananda Bhairavi and, and followed by a Bhairavi and then followed up by, by something else, like you, you can. If you're able to do it, wonderful. Mm. But I think, as Kamal Gidden said, there's uh, a certain level of grip that you have to have to do that to be able to pull that off well. Yeah. I would also say it's again a style and a musician based thing. So, as an accompanist, when I'm accompanying for X artist versus Y artist, yeah. I think the biggest thing I, I enjoy is that I'm playing for what that artist is, you know, what, what his style is. So for example, again, we'll take Shamanguri sir, cause that's an easy example. I think that when Lal Guri sir or MSG or any of the greats or UK sir, any of the greats have accompanied him, they were looking forward to that Marubalka every time. They were looking forward to that Shinam every time. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they've really, and they're like, oh, what can we do with this this time? What can we, and you can see that same level of enthusiasm yeah. in all of them in all of those recordings. Mm. And so I think that's another thing. As much as we also want variety as accompanists and as oh, main yeah. artists, we also want to be able to, you know, hear that artist and be like, oh, this is this artist's stamp. And I think that's another thing that's, uh, so if Vignesh is playing, or if I'm playing, I should be playing songs that, you know, showcase me as well is, yeah. is I think, another important aspect. Yeah. And I really guess, the way- yeah, related Sorry. to that, I guess, is um, do's and don'ts. 
So you said, you know, on the by the way, go there. But that's kind of about the song list. But what are some other do's and don'ts, I guess, before preparing for a concert or, you know, generally? To come look at this point, I don't think it's like a rigorous, hard and fast rule of this is a do and this is a don't. I think there's a couple of, of like explicit don'ts. Like the, the I think the on the way to the like example yeah. is a good don't in general practice. But yeah. even there, like a couple of kids said, like if you squint hard enough and there's a compelling use case for it, like you play an on the way to be song and someone who you really respect in the audience says, can you please play something in Riti Garda? Yeah. And you feel obliged to like, you should still be able to pull that off. So I think the only hard don't, I think for me is honestly Kala Pramanam stuff. Um, or like lack of thought right if you have there's been concerts I've played for where a sequence of four or five consecutive songs will be Sam Kala Pramanam Adi Thadam two after some of them back to back to back to back at that point it becomes very tough for a Murdangist no matter how like varietous your idea set is to be able to do something different because structurally speaking those songs are functionally the same mm. there's nuances and intricacies that you can go into for each particular song yeah. but structurally speaking you're you can only skin the cat so many different ways in this yeah. particular instance. Yeah. So I think that's my big, like, not pet peeve, but something to avoid for sure. Yeah. But even that, like, you can listen to a Chemungudi concert or a KBN concert, that will happen on occasion. Like, there will be a sequence of two to three songs that are out of my indie followed by Deadly Sinam or something. Like, there will be a sequence of those songs that happen. Yeah. Um, at which point, like, it's, it's okay because it's them. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe it's, it's more advice for ourselves than it is for any sort of outreach. Yeah. We asked Kamal how um, he would maybe structure a concert. Uh, same sort of question for Vignesh. How do you go about um, putting together a Tani Abdulam? Is this something you prepare beforehand or is that something that you sort of use the stage like energy to sort of give you ideas and that sort of thing? That's a really good question and one that I'm going to have to give us bipartite answer to because my views on this are are shifting so Shodam and sir has a Shodam and sir's general but that our pattern is he will have a list of things that he knows what he's going to do but everything else that happens on the stage is, is a flow thing based on the energy of, of the song at hand and how he's chatting with an artist he'll decide to or not to play specific things and okay. his kind of set patterns are it's the, the best way to describe them is he'll progress through the same kinds of sets that he teaches to all of his students, whether they're beginners or super experienced. And he'll add in elements of basically at certain points, he'll branch off of the set, like kind of subtle pattern, play some kind of special solo, and that'll transition into a corve, and then rinse and repeat, recycle through the rest of the, of the, of the Tani Alakana. Um, so the amount of like upfront preparation, like he won't ask the artist, you know, what are you going to sing? What's the name? What the item is it? He won't do any sort of super special preparation for that. Um, there are pros. You, even like asking for Oedipa and that sort of thing? No, he won't. Um, oh, I, mean, okay. I think nowadays, because he has a lot of input into particularly younger artists that he's encouraging his lists, he may ask for something particular, um, okay. ask for something in a particular kind of form. But in general, he's like, he's very off the cuff, like whatever comes will happen. Um, that works incredibly well for him because he can play just about anything that he wants at any speed, at any time, um, from anywhere, <laughs> at any, at any, in, in anything. Yeah. Um, for us mere mortals, uh, which there are many of us, I think that kind of approach doesn't necessarily work so well. And so the, there's, I've started to do a little bit more preparation, and this has consistently been, I think, my biggest uh, weakness as a Merlangist is my ability to kind of put together compelling Benny Artinums, not just from like a dexterity perspective, but like from a content perspective. Um, so that's something that I've been working, spending a little bit more time on, particularly this year and, and last year in terms of stitching more material together and doing a little bit more upfront preparation. Um, a lot of this is basically taking things that Chodam and Sir plays and expanding a little bit upon them because his structural set is to play, if they're not very elaborate sets, there's very few elaborate things that he puts together. It's always kind of dive into the idea, dive back out, dive into the next idea, dive back out. So adding a little bit of elaboration and also kind of sourcing from other schools and kind of joining that with how Chodam and Sir might play it. Um, so I guess my answer is a hybrid. I'll definitely like, if something gets out of control and the speed is not, it's not possible to play, excuse me, what I thought of before the concert in the concert or running out of time or something else, I'll make adjustments as necessary. But I have started to do a little bit more preparation beforehand to have at least more of a repertoire to draw, to draw from. Okay, cool. Nice. You mentioned you learned, you learned vocal, right? Through, um, was that quite a recent thing or did you always learn vocal? What was the reason for kind of? So, I had, I've been learning vocal probably, I think since I was 
seven or eight. So I started Merlingo when I was like five or six. Yeah. Um, again, very abbreviated. Vocal I started a couple years after, and that was honestly probably more continuous than the Merlingo at that point. Because again, as I said, my music teacher, Sha'an and Mama, moved from Boston to Michigan and then to DC. And so he was out of range. And so it was a lot of kind of self practice, but not a lot of new learning. And so at that point, I think vocal was actually a, a bigger priority at that point. Mm -hmm. um, Shiram Kumar basically happened after we moved to California. And then we did phone classes for a while. And then we were going to India one summer to learn from Shiram and Sir directly. Mm -hmm. And you know, that my teacher actually suggested, hey, Shiram Kumar is same school, same very. Um, he's also in Chennai, he lives five minutes from your house. You could even walk over there right across from Vidyalia. Why don't you, why don't you try that out? Um, he's also been a longtime family friend. We've hosted him for, you know, decades um, and at our house whenever my dad was on, when he was on tour. So that was a very logical progression. And he's obviously an incredible teacher. Um, he has the same kind of uncompromising attention to detail for many things and a huge depth of knowledge. I think that it's been, it's always been, at least after that point, when I became more serious about Madhangam, it's been in service towards kind of just having a bigger understanding of music at large, which helps a lot because Chiram Kumar has a plethora of kind of rare kritis that are not commonly sung that are really useful to have in your back pocket when someone throws them at you. It also is interesting because especially in this area with my brother also learning from him and a lot of people in the area learning from him, it's very self-serving because a lot of those people will sing those songs in concert. And it makes a huge difference to be able to know a rare Dikshita Kriti versus not knowing a rare Dikshita Kriti. Yeah. Um, so that, I think it's, in now it's mainly in service. Like I really enjoy singing. I'm not very good at it. I do a lot of singing in the shower is my primary means of self-expression there. But it's super helpful in service towards like being better at Madonna, being able to accompany better. Yeah. You both being instrumentalists, does vocal or having like a knowledge of vocal, how, how does that help your, your uh, violin or your Mridangam? So I will say that I would, I think you don't have to be the best singer. You don't have to be able to sing everything, but you should know music. You should know the song, not just the dalam. I mean, this is a very easy thing. As a violinist, I could say, well, for a violinist, you should definitely know, like, I would say, ideally, everyone should know all the words and should be able to, like, appreciate the meaning and everything. But especially for the violinist, you need to, you know, you need to know the sahityam, you need to somewhat know the meaning, even if it's not word by word meaning, you need to know the general gist of the meaning um, so that you can convey that mood uh, for sure. And then also as someone who, as a person with preferences, because I do have, you know, people like accompanying me as well, I would of course prefer the Mirdangas who knows the song over the Mirdangas who doesn't know the song. Um, yeah. and that it, you get, you can just see that in the way they play. I mean, Vignesh yeah. you know, vocal is such a huge asset because, you know, there are very few songs that I can play and he'll be like, what, what is this song? It's very <laughs> cool. And, um, that's a really good thing because he, he knows, even if he hasn't heard it much, the amount of knowledge that he has in the vocal can be enough to be like, all right, I assume because this is a Dikshitar song. And this is this type of, you know, it, it follows this type of yeah. that this is probably how I should play for it. Yeah. So um, I kind of answered for Vignesh, but I'm also talking about, I'm, t I'm also kind of talking as someone who's performed with him and many other Mirdangis. You take any Mirdangis in India, um, you know, a lot of the people that I've interacted with, like, you know, N.C. Bharadwaj or uh, Sumesh and all of them, they, they definitely know the song. They're accompanying the song. They're not just accompanying using a template. Yeah, a hundred percent. You can yeah. hear it through, through their recordings. They, exactly. they, if you were to remove the main instrument, you could probably hear the song through their playing. Yeah. That's yeah. something that Raman Sir actually says you should try to do. Like if you, two things should be true. When you isolate just the Murdangam in a track, it should be as grandiose as like a Thaniyadhanam in and of itself. And you should be able to identify what exactly the song is for. Now that's easier said than done, but I think that's an interesting kind of way to template it. Yeah. The thing that Chodam and Sir actually recommends, just to zag a little bit, because I think I'm in total alignment with what Kamlikit is saying. One thing that he will emphasize is don't know too much music, which I'd always like scratch my head going, well, what does that mean? But there is a balance between playing Mridangam for vocal and just playing vocal on the Mridangam. Yes. There's like a subtle difference. Like you could honestly, if you were so in tune with someone that you knew exactly what was coming from the entire song, you could play the song directly without adding any sort of Murdangam flourishes to it. And it's, it's, you, it depends on how far the pendulum swings. I get in trouble with 
my wife Arthi all the time for over following is, is what she calls it. <laughs> when you get over like you're over picky about particular sangharis or particular things and you sacrifice maybe a little bit of flow in terms of Mudangam flow for it. But it's a very, again, it's in that subjective range of things that some people prefer it a lot, some people don't. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding where that balance lies. Yeah. Right. I do I have to add, yeah, I do have to add one more thing. Um, not as, not as from the violinist's point of view, even when we're accompanying, and let's say that there's some song that we've never heard before. And it just happens, everyone hears songs that you've never heard before. Or it's like a Nerval line that you're unfamiliar with. And you know, the vocal is just singing Nerval you have, or let's take a Pallavi that you're hearing on the same spot, like on the spot, and the vocalist is singing Nerval, by the end of those two rounds, I should have picked up the Sahityam. And I should have been able to, you know, play not just the tune, but actually bow the Sahityam. Yeah. Um, and I think knowing vocal goes a long way to be able yeah. to do that faster. Yeah. Um, I would have to add that. I mean, same thing for Midangam, I, I'm sure, knowing that, you know, picking up that Pallavi line and stuff, it's, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's more than just so look at for the Midangas. They are definitely also thinking about the Sahityam. And then they use the so look at to be like, all right, how can I embellish this? Like what Vignesh was saying. Bingo. Mm. Um, so my question is like, what is uh, a Kamal, Kamal or a Vignesh practice session? What does that, what does that entail? What does that look like? I mean, it's a, unfortunately a, a rarer sighting than I would like it to be. I want to be <laughs> questions popping up, but I've been trying to be better about it, especially now that I have a lot of time at home. All of us have a lot of time at home. Typically what I'll do is I'm, so I usually set a couple of different kind of speed goals for specific solas that I'm not super comfortable with at high speed. And there's a chunk of time, probably five, 10 minutes allocated towards just working on that one thing. Um, the current target, if you're curious, is not going to be me to be me in mail column, which which is something that I struggle with to play precisely. Like I can play it with a floppy hand, but not with a with an actual like tight adherence to how it should be played. And then a lot of just going through kinds of things that I've been kicking around in my head um, and trying to assemble them together into a coherent kind of piece that I can reuse. Um, if Arthi's around, I'll ask her to sing maybe a song or two. Um, if, she, if she's learning a song, then that also helps to, to kind of keep my ears open and, and add something to my repertoire. Um, my goal this year has been to try to do like 30 minutes of practice, 15 to 30 minutes of practice a day without fail. And then obviously concerts add to that total and you're able to get more kind of in-person experience um, in, and performing experience. Um, that's the typical structure. And then I'll also spend some time if I do think of some new idea or someone tells me a new idea or sends me a new idea. I'm trying to build an, an encyclopedia, annotated encyclopedia for all the stuff that I have. And so I'll spend some time transcribing that and adding it to my Google Doc. Oh, wow. So, so do you, you notate your cordways and things? Yeah, it, I mean, it's more than just the cordway because I think there's a lot of notation for that stuff, but it's also like the preamble, if you will. Like how do you okay. leave, what, what transitions are useful, what other right. things do with it. Um, and I'm trying to assemble it for not just cordways, but also just like general solo patterns and, and progressions and cordways and endings and any sort of stuff. I think the next big target will be once I get a more robust set of these things, also focusing on like endings and mutayams and other sorts of stuff that I think are also gaps in my current playing. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Kamal? Yeah, for me, if I could practice one thing, this is what I do every day without fail. I, okay, that's wrong, not without fail, but this is what I try to do almost every day, um, especially now with all the time that we have. But especially as someone like Vignesh or us who are also studying at the same time right now, um, like I'm doing my master's and also doing this. And for people, when we have to like juggle time, okay. if there's one thing that I have to practice, regardless of what I practice, it will always be Tristai and um, Alankaram and Dr. Barse. Um, always. Um, yeah. and I will put a metronome on, and I will, that, that will happen. That will usually take 40 minutes in and itself. When I, if I do it right, many times that's compromised. But if I do it right, that itself takes the bulk of the practice. Like yesterday morning, I woke up and I was like, I got to be productive. So, you know, I started at, I think I started at 1.30 because that's what the thing showed up at. And I went till 180 trying to do Alankarams and Dr. Versailles and different Dragams, different Melakattas and 
this thy, uh, you know, three octaves, all yeah. of that. Once I'm done with all of that, the next top, the second priority goes to learning the new song with whatever bottom I'm trying to do, because big thing is also keeping the repertoire up mm. um, and making sure that you learn as many compositions as you can in the different, all the ragas. Um, so right now I'm working on a padam um, in uh, Mukari, Ososi. I mean, I've, I've learned it, but I'm revising Ososi right, right now. And there are a lot of, lot of things that I, um, try to like do repertoire wise and many times that's also just me singing before I even play it because sometimes I, I have to you know I'm driving or I'm doing something else and I'm like also learning at the same time right and then if I really have a lot of time on my hands then the next thing I try to do is obviously monodharma practice whatever I feel like playing ideas like Vignesh said a huge thing for me is especially in the more advanced classes um when I'm uh, teaching actually is when a lot of my ideas will come out and that will already be recorded. So I'll be referring back to those. Okay. And then another thing I really like to do is accompany, especially when at a time like this, when I have no concerts and I don't have an RT at home who I can ask to sing, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would usually go to YouTube, um, put any great master um, or current master and, uh, sorry, rephrase that, any old master or current master, they're all great, yeah. and um, try to accompany that and see where I, what, what all I have to work. Yeah, now, as I, if definitely you were... don't, I definitely don't get all of this done in one practice right. session, that's yeah. realistic, but these are the things that I would like to do and I do. Apart from that, I listen every day without a doubt. I just always am listening, so mm -hmm. that's, that's a big one for me. Yeah. So just on the... Um... So you pra you're saying you uh, practice the Alan Karams and the Data Valises. Yeah. Uh, what's like, what's the thing that you most get from that practice? Is it like a, just warming up your fingers or is it learning the ragam a bit more or? So a couple of things, right? One, knowing vocal helps in this. I can, you know, expanding a ragam, playing Naraval Swaram, I can sing that even if I don't, and if, even if I'm like, doing other things i can at least always think about music yeah. but the only thing that i have to keep myself in check on at least the, the minimal that i can do is keep my fingers warmed up and keep them ready and what the dataverses and alankarams do is not only do they enforce speed they enforce clarity proper gamakams when playing at different speeds um and tristai just mastery over the instrument so that i can play for different styles or whatever I learn or whatever I'm singing. So I think those exercises are definitely important because as much as knowledge and music you have, if you can't execute them, then they're, you know, this just enforces execution, I would say. And yeah. One of the limiting factors for a Merlangist or a violinist is not so much what you can, I mean, there's two axes. One is the mental and the other is the physical. The mental is just related to how much you're attuned with the music and how much, like, what can you think of playing? But it doesn't matter if you can think of playing something if you can't play it, you're you're toast. So I think that's the same thing for you know why same thing in Murdangan practice. I don't think I elaborated quite as much as Kamala ended, but a lot of it is just kind of pushing the boundaries and trying to push the envelope of what you can play. Um, you'll notice that the great masters can play anything they want to, basically any Kala Pramana. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we have to aspire to. Whether it's slow or fast, but yeah. typically the limiting factor is not the slow, it's the fast. <laughs> For violin, actually, I would even say slow because the, when you play really slow, the gamma comes that True. that are there. Um, granted, I don't practice that in alankarams and doctor verses as much. Rather, in songs, I do that. Yeah. Like if I take a jetashri or something and I try to milk it as much as I can, as slow as I can, and then also try to get that same bhavam on a faster tempo and kind of figure out what kala pramanams it can be uh, done in. Yeah, so true. Also, for just like being able to hold a kala pramanam at slow speeds. The temptation to speed is very, <laughs> it's really easy to get faster, um, but it's hard to maintain the rhythm at that slow tempo. Yeah. Well, when you're practicing Manodhamra, so uh, obviously as a violinist, you're always going to be on, put on the spot. You know, you're probably going to have to play ragams that you've never heard of. You're probably going to play, you know, ragam, you know, any song that you probably wouldn't know. There'll be neither of us that need to play and you wouldn't even know the type. Yeah. Right, so right. How, how, how do you kind of prepare for that? You don't. <laughs> You yeah. just don't prepare for that. Um, I think 
the bulk of that goes into listening. Yeah. When, when you're listening and you're listening to all that's there, there's so much to always listen to and grasp, grasp from that. All you can do is be as prepared as you can. And yeah. I think um, you'll never know exactly what's going to come yeah. your way. And I guess what you said about, you know, accompanying like legends on audio recordings, I guess. That's, 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 a, good, that's a good thing to do just because yeah. as much as you know their styles, you can also know if you're able to play <laughs> or not. And um, I've, uh, I think that helps a lot. But more than that, just listening. Yeah. I think that experience as a violinist and listening and I, I always tell my students and other friends I'll be like if you want to get better at Kanaka and re replicating Kanaka for example we'll take one thing if you wanted the easiest thing to actually improve is Kanaka I'll say okay you went to a concert and you heard some Kanaka the second as a violinist in my head I'm accompanying in my head even if I'm listening to a concert I'm like all right this is where it started this is the pattern that's there I, I'm already doing it that's it's like a second nature because that's how I'm trained as a violinist yeah. Um, similarly, if I'm hearing a ragam, I'm like, okay, here, 30 seconds of the ragam are gone. Here are the most important phrases that he's sung. This is the range in which he or she is singing in. Yeah. Uh, probably going to be the song. I'm already going through the checklist that a violinist goes through. Yeah. So I think a lot of that preparation you can do even with that, like just by listening, you can train your mind in being a violinist and or a mridangist yeah. and uh, figuring out that's my end. And I think, yeah, I'll let Vignesh... <laughs> elaborate on how he does that no it's almost exactly the same thing if you're at a concert so there's like there's active and passive listening right passive listening is just kind of it, it goes in one ear or out the other maybe you, you absorb some something the active listening is why i can't listen to carnotic music when i'm trying to do work because that you're already putting yourself in accompaniment mode so you're okay what would i play here what is going on what is the next line what ending will i play um, and rhythm since it's almost entirely similar to violin really accompaniment it's you're not really setting a plan too far in advance. You don't know exactly what they're gonna sing. You don't know what similes are gonna come. So you're basically like, it's a branching path that you're constructing in your head. I'm at this point. I have these different optionalities that I could go to. They went here, okay, I'm gonna pick this one. I'm gonna take this branching path, then I'm gonna take this pathway. Mm -hmm. And kind of maintaining that, maintaining and pruning that tree in your head as things become more clear is, is the active listening part. And I think that's something that if you, if you really wanna get better at it, yeah, you should, listen to what how other people construct their trees and, and what choices they make through it but also try to do it yourself for everything that you're listening to mm. and so like i said this is why i can't listen to chronic music when i'm trying to get work because i'll focus on that and not on the work i just had another sort of related question so you guys must have like a, a massive repertoire um so for camo it's your krithis and things uh vignesh is probably moras chord rays ending chord rays solas that sort of thing is it do you like um practice through those how, how, how do you like make sure that you don't forget a certain kriti or for it, like a certain charanem or an anapalavi or a certain ending of a chord verse, that, that sort of thing? For me, it's very easy. I, I'll, mine will be a short answer. Teaching has been a blessing in that. Because okay. when I have people, I, I make it a point. There are two things that I do. One, any song, I'll be like, okay, I have forgotten this song. I know that I've forgotten this. I will teach that next because I'll be like, all right, this is what I have to revise. Or if I just learned a song to ingrain it further in my memory, I will teach that as well. Like, this is just what I learned. I want this ingrained. Now, this might not be the right way to go about the process, but for me, it's worked really well. That's how I keep my repertoire going, uh, or keep it fresh in my memory. In general, I think Carnatic music has a documentation problem, and I'm coming at this from a software development perspective, but <laughs> we have a documentation problem. It's, there's no one real, and I think it's especially difficult for, for annotating songs and kritis because how do you really capture the nuance of a gamakam without like an accompanying like recording? Like you can write as much stuff down as you want, but if you don't hear the recording, like it's very hard to piece together where exactly does the curve go and how exactly does it work? Or then it was a little bit easier because it is mathematically sound and as long as you get the effect you're, you're probably pretty close so i've been trying to write more stuff as much as possible down which i think helps a lot um i do try to run through the repertoire every once in a while and a lot of it also comes down to concerts like if i know what's coming for a concert i will go back to my book and i'll open it up and i'll say okay what other things can i play now that i know that this is coming then just about kind of keeping track of what you played in previous concerts this is something that i've been meaning to do but haven't done is if you kept a running journal of all the things that you played in each concert, then you can also avoid repetition. I think it's easier for a main artist to not repeat song lists, but I guess it also applies to Mervangus. Like you don't want to play the same thing out and I'm in the same spot one year separated. Someone may remember. 
So sure. you want to try to balance that as well. So this is the rapid fire round. Uh, we've got 21 questions for you both. Uh, whatever pops into your head, just say it out loud. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, the ragam you play slash think of when you're happy. Uh, Maya Malavagorda. Kambuji. Ragam that you play or think of when you're down. The Javanti. Kambuji. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Nade to explore. Kandam. Kandam. Favorite Thilana. Lalgudi Dujavanti. Um, my Guru Sahana. Most memorable concerts. Sikul Gurcharan last December. Yeah, impossible to choose. Probably the first time I played with my guru on stage. Most embarrassing stage moment. With Kamala Kiran at UC Berkeley, could not play a Rupaka Chaputana Mora for <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> uh, for me, would probably be my first concert. The main was said to be Riti Gaula, and I was set on it being Riti Gaula. Um, and this is before I knew much music. It was, honestly, I was nine years old or 10. And uh, the singer switched it up and sang Ranjani instead. And I had no clue what to do. And I was <laughs> definitely, I, uh, everyone saw me cry there. So definitely that. Oh. <laughs> Weirdest slash funniest concert moment. I had to burp in the middle of my penny out today. And then I tried to hold it in and then I started <laughs> coughing. It, it was all bad. Somehow I kept playing. The amount of times that my, my violin strings have popped and I didn't have an extra string, so I had to announce in the mic, if anyone has a violin or an extra string, please let wow. me know. <laughs> Interesting fan encounter. Someone asked for my autograph once. I still haven't gotten over that. Someone almost kidnapped me in a temple once. So, I mean, they didn't actually kidnap me, but they kept on asking my dad if they could take me out to a restaurant after the concert. Without cool. my dad accompanying them, so I would definitely say that. Okay. <laughs> Favorite ragam at this moment in time? Surti. Currently, so for me, all-time favorite is always Kamboji. That's not going to change. But uh, currently, probably Kapi. One place you would like to visit in the world? Would like to go to Bali because that was supposed to be our honeymoon. We're supposed to be there like this coming week, and oh all... no. So next year. Uh, it was Singapore, but I just went to Singapore finally. So right now it's New Zealand. A venue you would like to perform at? Music Academy. Sydney Opera House. Artists from the yesteryear that you are most scared to accompany? Vintage TNF. Vindamma. If you are stranded on an island and only allowed to bring one recording, so a, a song recording, or a, or a Tani Alden recording, what would that be? 1968, Madras Music Academy, Chamangudi, Lalgudi, Shoram Mama, Maru Balka. <laughs> MSG's Nanina Kanti. Favorite food? Anything with paneer in it. <laughs> pizza, pizza, I love yeah. pizza. Uh, tea or coffee? Neither. Tea. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Marvel. Favorite sports team? Golden State Warriors. Mm, I have to say Washington Redskins, even though I, I just have to. <laughs> Favorite city in the US, other than the one that you live in? New York, New York. Probably LA. Travel forwards or backwards in time? Backwards. Probably backwards for me too. Favorite TV show? Psych. And best party trick? I can wiggle my ears together and separately, and I can cross <laughs> one eye at a time. Nice. <laughs> None. <laughs> Vignesh, do you want to demonstrate your party trick? I'd rather not. Uh, <laughs> but I'll show you guys offline. That's, that's the 21. Thanks, guys. Okay, next up, we have uh, a section for Kurepu. Common Kiran and Vignesh, each of you can play like a mathematical pattern. And the, so the other person would kind of replicate that. And to spice things up, we'll throw around different ragas um, at random. So come again, you would have to play your part in that ragam. And obviously, okay. you should replicate and you can alternate. Um, so first ragam, please, could we have uh, Chadamati? All right. 
Okay. Uh, next up, we have Kalavati. Hindustani or uh, Karnasik? Oh, also. Tiagaraja or Dikshit or Kalavati? Uh, Tiagaraja, please. Okay. <laughs> Next up we have Manjari. Baba Priya. Uh, next, please, can we have Arabi? Okay. Okay. Ratnangi. Last one is Devagandali. Ah, oh, vale. Thanks, guys. Great work. That was brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
you're so we both are so willing to take up challenges I mean, this is not an easy task. Obviously, there's so much to think about. There's, you know, there's a ragam, there's a, you know, a pattern that you now need to replicate. And even like converting a, like a layer-based or mathematical pattern into swaram is very hard. And, you know, sticking to the ragam, I think it's, it's very challenging. And the fact that you both, you know, are willing to take up such a challenge, I think it's very inspiring. And I hope that everyone watches this and enjoys it. I guess before we wrap up, do you guys maybe you can give some advice to aspiring musicians? Sure. Um, listen a lot and practice a lot. That's that's what we all have to do, and that is, is the invariant that never changes. Um, nothing more to add other than there is something that you really want to do and that you want to get better at. No matter what you have, you'll make time for it. So there's no such thing as not enough time. Um, and that's something that I try to follow, that Vignesh tries to follow. And then I would hope that everyone else also tries to follow that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. That's the end of our podcast for this evening. Um, we've learned a lot. I hope the listeners have too. Um, the Kurepa was uh, a highlight of today, I think. That was pretty special. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, and thanks for your advice as well. Um, and most of all, thanks for your time. Thank you, Dave. Um, Thank you all so much. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thank you.